Hi, I'm Marilyn Klein, President and Owner of Fiberglass Developments. Hi, I'm Scott Campbell, Sales and Operations Manager at Fiberglass Developments. This video is the second part of a two-part series in which we lead the fabrication team for the University of Akron in building a super mileage race car. Although we typically are not fabricators, I had agreed to provide a fabrication leader to the University of Akron in exchange for being able to videotape the entire process of building the car. The Premix Corporation, Goodyear, and Fiberglass Developments all participated in financial support of the car and are proud to have been part of this unique educational project. I agreed at the request of the College of Polymer Engineering to work with the College of Mechanical Engineering to supply a fabrication team leader to assist the students in building an all-composite racer shell. This car would participate in the SAE Super Mileage Competition. The essence of this race is attaining fuel mileage in excess of 1,000 miles per gallon. I was the fabrication leader and worked with the students and faculty through the process of designing and building their composite car. I was excited to share technologies from the aerospace and racing industries with the students and I'm glad to show you how these technologies can be duplicated in a home shop at a reasonable cost. What was in my mind's eye through the entire process was of course the finished car which you see here. We began the design envisioning the overall shape of the vehicle. We envisioned the shape as simply a shell without supporting systems. We knew that the shell we were constructing would be modified to accommodate these systems when it was complete. These systems were anticipated in the design of the plug. The shape of the vehicle was the shape of the plug. We built female molds from the plug and are ready to construct the finished shells in this video. The entire process of building the car took several months. The complete project is edited into two videos. This is the second video of the two-part series. The first video demonstrated construction of the plug and the advanced mold making techniques required to build the large polyester molds. We begin here with the molds which were built in the first video and are ready to begin fabrication of the shell demonstrating a graphite honeycomb sandwich and vacuum bagging techniques. Throughout these two videos, we are following the same steps as outlined in our molding fiberglass video. We have completed steps one through four in the sister video and are beginning here with step five, which is to prepare the mold for fabrication of the part. Sandwich core construction and vacuum bagging are both techniques used to maximize the physical properties of advanced composite materials. Sandwich core construction permits a part to be made much stiffer with little weight penalty by laminating a core between layers of reinforcement. Okay. By facing both sides of a low density material such as honeycomb or foam with layers of high strength materials such as fiberglass or carbon fiber, you make a structural sandwich where the skin materials carry the tensile and compressive loads while the core provides support and separation. The main requirement is the use of a resin or adhesive system which is strong enough to bond all these layers together and will resist interlaminar peel. If the skin facings are permitted to slide on the core, all mechanical advantage is lost. Vacuum bagging is a process which pressurizes the laminate during cure, compressing fiber bundles and optimizing the resin content. Until recently, this technology was out of reach of most home builders. Now, however, all the materials necessary are readily available and only the knowledge of how to use them is needed before making amazingly strong structures. You can watch over our shoulders as we use this technology to produce the super fuel mileage racer. Because we use both sandwich core construction and vacuum bagging to build this shell, we will be performing both techniques in a single lamination. However, you can build a sandwich core laminate without vacuum bagging. You could also vacuum bag a part which was made without a sandwich core. The first step in advanced laminating is to develop the lamination schedule. The lamination schedule consists of the number and orientation of the plies of reinforcement, as well as the type of sandwich material that is to be placed into the mold. This schedule should have been developed during the design phase of the project, but it must be laid out now, on paper, and will begin the formal plan of the lamination. The schedule will be unique for each part and is determined by the expected operating conditions for the part. These conditions would include how strong it must be, how much it should weigh, and how much load it should bear. In the case of the super mileage vehicle, 
the top shell only needed to be strong enough to support its own weight and shape. However, the bottom shell was the structural unit of the entire vehicle and needed enough strength and rigidity over its length to support a number of secondary structures, including the engine as well as the driver. Both the bottom and the top needed to be extremely lightweight, and we wanted the shell to require no frame. The schedule for the top shell consisted of three plies of carbon fiber and epoxy resin with honeycomb sandwich core strips added as selective stiffeners. The first ply of carbon fiber will be placed into the mold with its warp fibers running along the longitudinal axis of the vehicle. This orientation will be referred to as a zero degree ply. The second ply was cut on the bias with its warp fibers running at 45 degrees to the longitudinal axis of the car. The third ply was another zero degree ply. Strips of Nomex honeycomb were placed between the second and third plies of the carbon fiber. The lamination schedule for the bottom shell consisted of seven plies of carbon fiber and epoxy resin with a honeycomb sandwich between the fourth and fifth layers of carbon. Because we did not want the honeycomb cells to fill with resin, we decided to laminate and vacuum bag the bottom shell in two portions. The outer skin of the shell will consist of four plies of carbon fiber. The first ply had its warp fibers at zero degrees to the longitudinal axis of the vehicle. The second and third plies were oriented at 45 degrees from the axis, meaning that the fabric would be cut on the bias. The fourth and final ply was another zero degree oriented layer. The inner skin of the sandwich would only be three layers thick. Ply orientation was zero, 45, and zero degrees with respect to the longitudinal axis. When we laid up the shells, we knew we needed to create the vacuum before the parts were completely cured, and that this would require us to move quickly. If you are going to vacuum bag, you must also document your vacuum bagging schedule. The top shell would be constructed in one pass and then vacuum bagged when the lamination was complete. However, we planned on bagging the bottom shell in two portions. The first portion would be the outer skin of the shell and would consist of the first through fourth layers of carbon. This would be bagged and cured before continuing. After the cure was complete, we would remove the vacuum bagging materials and continue with the second part of the lamination. The first layer of the second portion would be the honeycomb. By laying in the honeycomb in after the first cure, we would avoid having entrapped resin in the cells of the honeycomb. The peel ply will be placed directly against the resin surface. A peel ply is used because it will not stick to the cured part. In this case, we decided to use a porous nylon peel ply, which would allow resin to pass through these tiny holes throughout the entire surface. We therefore needed a bleeder breather layer to absorb the excess resin as well as to direct the flow of vacuum. Finally, we would need the bag itself. The second step in advanced laminating is to pre-cut and prepare your materials. When you are laminating a large project like this one, you do not want to take time to lay out and cut your materials while you are laminating. Because your resin will begin curing as soon as it is mixed, you will need to be prepared to work calmly and quickly. A full-scale template is recommended for all cuts. One template would be needed for each mold half and can then be used for all of your fabric cuts. This template could be made from paper, plastic, or a less expensive fabric. The idea is to avoid miscutting the expensive carbon. You need to create a template and cut the fabric just slightly larger than the mold edge so that you will be trimming down rather than filling in any spaces. If at all possible, you want to cut your fabric in large pieces. Darts or piecing of fabrics will reduce the properties, as will snags or broken fibers. You also need to avoid creases. If you are able to lay down your template into the mold and avoid creases, you will also be able to avoid creases in your reinforcing fabric. There are times, however, that fabric will lay into areas that paper will not. If you only have a slight crease or overlap in your paper template, you would want to attempt to lay in your fabric before resorting to relief cuts. The template can then be laid on the fabric at the appropriate angle and cut with scissors. Final trimming is usually done in the mold to ensure a perfect fit before any relief cuts are made. Relief cuts are made only when a perfect fit is absolutely certain. The pre-cut reinforcements are then rolled, labeled, and set aside in the order in which they will be used. The top shell will be constructed in a single piece and only one template will be required. However, as you can see, 
The bottom shell would need to cover the wheel housing and would require three pieces. A separate template was made for the wheel housing and two triangular pieces were cut following the exact schedule for the lower half of the mold. A separate full scale template was also made to cut the Nomex honeycomb. The template for the honeycomb of the lower shell was cut two inches shy of any outer dimensions of the part. This would effectively seal the honeycomb and give the part better resistance to inner laminar peel and shear forces. The two inch reduction would also allow the inner skin to form a strong mechanical bond to the outer carbon fiber skin. This template was also laid in the mold to verify that it could be placed in one sheet without patching or requiring darts. The template was then traced on the honeycomb and it was cut with a razor blade. The edges of the honeycomb were beveled somewhat so the transition area would not be as abrupt and likely to entrap air pockets. The cut sheet of honeycomb was also rolled, labeled, and set aside for use in the proper mold half after the correct number of layers of carbon fiber had been applied. Finally, you will want to pre-cut all of your vacuum bagging materials. Unlike your reinforcements or honeycomb, these need to be considerably larger than your part to allow enough room for sealing and adjustments. It is not necessary to use a template for your vacuum bagging materials. Just be sure that you have allowed more than enough to cover your part and build the bag. Cut your vacuum bagging materials before you begin laminating and also set them aside in the order that they will be used. The third step of advanced laminating is the same as for any molding process, which is to prepare your molds with mold release agents. You must take time to properly prepare the molds. As you will see when these parts are released later in this video, you do not want a spot to stick. These molds were waxed with six coats of wax and sprayed with two coats of PVA. We are ready to begin the sixth step of molding, which is to laminate your part. The top shell was not as complex as the lower shell. We want to show you the top shell in its completed form. As you can see from the outlines, the honeycomb was placed in strategic strips for structural support. Because these strips would only have a single layer of graphite and resin on top, we decided to vacuum bag the lamination in one portion. After the shell was released from the mold, however, the honeycomb strips could not be seen from the top. The surface was smooth and the top shell was complete. There were additional secondary operations to perform, which we will show you at the conclusion of this video. The layup we are about to document is the lower shell of the super mileage racer. This was more complex than the upper unit and will serve as a better instructional tool because this shell will be made in two cures. We will first laminate the outer skin and vacuum bag it until it is fully cured. After it is cured and the vacuum bagging materials are removed, the honeycomb and inner plies will be bonded in place. We do not recommend laminating a full sheet of honeycomb into the outer skin when using wet layup techniques because the cells will fill with resin. It is best to allow the outer skin to cure, then bond the honeycomb and inner skin to it later with epoxy. Because of our difficulty releasing the top shell, we decided to make some additional mold modifications, as this student explains. Since the uh, last time when we pulled the mold out, we had trouble with it because of the surface tension, though. The shell would stick to the mold. Now, by, by having these holes, these are about a quarter, uh, quarter of an inch diameter. Uh, we can have knockout dowel pins in there, so it'll be easy to pop out. To begin the layup of the outer skin of the bottom shell, we assembled the first four pre-cut layers of carbon fiber near the fabrication area. The first layer was placed into the mold dry. This way, it could be accurately positioned before applying any resin. While we were placing the fabric, another student was mixing the epoxy. As soon as the epoxy was mixed, we had to become aware of the time. Again, we're most concerned with getting along here. And we're going to have to work pretty hard to get that saturated, OK? We knew that the resin would want to pool on the bottom. I had decided not to apply a surface coat and instead allowed the resin to saturate the graphite from the top. We would be vacuum bagging out the excess resin, and I believe we could adequately saturate this surface layer without a surface coat. We still didn't want any dry spots, of course. I was more concerned that we would not get enough resin into this layer or that we would trap air pockets. After the bottom was saturated from the top, we poured resin down the sides. This created a surface coat where it was needed on the sides without pooling in the bottom. The key was to pull the resin up and keep it from running into the bottom. We could work the resin up the sides with squeegees to eliminate excess. We also worked out air pockets and dry spots with rollers. 
We were working out into the nose of the shell now. The most important thing was to get all the air pockets out of corners and curves. Okay, it's going to stick to the sides now, you guys who are holding the side. Now, the big thing is here, let's not worry about how much resin we have yeah. that we put onto it, okay, because we'll, we'll take it back off later. What we want to do is get it thoroughly soaked. While removing excess resin from the body of the shell, a separate team laminated the wheel hub. The wheel hub would follow the lamination and vacuum bagging schedules exactly. Using a light, air bubbles can often be seen that would otherwise be missed. You have to be careful, however, to keep the light moving and not create a hot spot on the laminate. We still have three layers to go before we vacuum bag, so we don't want the resin to start curing in one hot place. When the resin is spread out like this, however, you have considerably more working time than when the resin is in a mixing tub. With the final check for air bubbles, the first layer was completed, and we were ready for the second layer, which was a 45-degree ply. Cut diagonally off a roll of 50-inch wide fabric, the 45-degree layers were not long enough to cover the entire mold from nose to tail. This wasn't a problem. We just cut extra 45-degree bias pieces of fabric to fill in the gaps. We overlapped the pieces slightly as we applied them. Just as we finished the first layer, we were ready to roll in the second. By rolling it down the sides into the mold, we were able to ensure proper fiber orientation. If this became skewed, especially in addition to contact with wet resin, it would be difficult or impossible to line up without damaging the fibers. By rolling the fabric down the side, we could smooth the fabric as it went down rather than trying to pull it up from the bottom or tug it into place. We can rely on the existing resin to help saturate this layer as well as hold up the sides. We are still interested in time and want to move as quickly as possible without leaving any air pockets, dry spots, or excess resin. We also do not want to pull out excess fibers from the cut edges of the graphite. Fabrics want to shred when they are cut, and the problem gets worse when they are wet. We have to work carefully at these piece areas to make sure that loose fibers are not skewing the fiber orientation or causing air pockets. We can add triangular pieces to seam the rest of the 45 degree ply as soon as the large piece is completely smooth. We could rely on the resin from the first layer to hold the second in place, as well as begin saturating it. When resin was applied to this layer, it was applied more carefully to avoid pulling up the edges in the spliced areas, and it was also applied more sparingly. We were still not real concerned about excess resin, as we needed some wetness to hold on to the third and fourth layers. We again covered the wheel hub with a layer of graphite, which was also cut at a 45 degree angle. At this point, we were approximately a half hour into the lamination. Although we had to mix a fresh batch of epoxy to continue, the resin that was in the mold was still wet and workable. The third layer was another 45 degree ply and was added much like the one you have just seen. It was rolled into position down the sides, pieced in where required by the bias cut, and separate 45 degree segments covered the rear wheel arch support. By now, little resin had to be applied to saturate the fabric as existing resin from the first three layers could be pulled up for wet out. Forty minutes have passed since we began. Just a small amount of resin was needed. At this point, we were concerned with removing as much excess resin as possible. The more resin removed, the lighter the final shell would be. We weren't worried about removing too much because thoroughly saturated fiber bundles will retain more resin than a squeegee can remove. With the excess resin removed by hand, we performed the final trimming of the mold flange before the vacuum bagging began. This was necessary in order to expose a few inches of the mold, which is where the sealant tape would be applied for the vacuum bagging process. We cleaned the flange with acetone to remove any excess resin. Resin would keep the tape from sealing. After the flange was clean, we laid the sealant tape down without removing the paper tape cover. We could remove this quickly when we were ready to seal the bag. Everyone was working independently and cohesively to get everything done as quickly as possible. We have been working with the resin for about an hour. The resin that is in the laminate is still wet and excess should still be removable through the vacuum bagging process. The laminate is now done and we are ready to vacuum bag. 
The first layer of vacuum bagging material we put into the mold was the peel ply layer. Peel ply should be used over any surface which contains resin. In this case, we chose the nylon peel ply because it would allow excess resin to pass through it while imparting a textured surface finish on the part. This surface texture allows for maximum secondary bonding with little or no surface sanding. The peel ply was cut roughly to length before the lamination began and was simply draped in place over the wet layup. We trimmed the excess peel ply, trying to get it to lay down over the part. The next layer to enter the mold was the bleeder breather cloth. This layer maintained even airflow over the entire surface of the lamination. It would also absorb the resin which flows from the part through the peel ply. It too must be cut so it will contact the entire mold surface without bridging or leaving voids. Additionally, two squares of this breather were also cut which were folded underneath the vacuum couplings. The extra breather material assures that the vacuum is not pinched off as it enters the bag and keeps the vacuum coupling base from printing through onto the molded part. Now we are ready to apply the bag. As part of the preparation of the vacuum bagging materials, the vacuum couplings were attached to the bag. Cuts were made in the bag before it was placed on the part to allow attachment of the couplings. We had decided to attach two vacuum tubes during each vacuum bagging routine so we needed two couplings attached to each bag. We felt that two tubes would help ensure uniform vacuum. The final layer into the mold is the vacuum bag itself. It is dropped loosely into position just like the other vacuum bagging materials but as soon as you are sure that you have a proper fit it needs to be sealed to the mold flange. You need to seal the bag on all edges. Start firmly pressing the bag to the tape in one location and work around the perimeter of the part removing paper and attaching the bag. Be sure to pull the bag taut before sticking it to the tape as even small wrinkles can cause frustrating leaks. If you encounter complex contours, you would make pleats or tucks so excess bagging film is available to fully cover all areas. Do not rely upon this material to stretch. If necessary, use sealant tape or other sections of bagging film to enlarge or widen the bag. Keep this to a minimum, however, because it is another location for potential leaks. The mate of the coupling was attached after the bag was in place. A separate bag was pieced together to cover the rear wheel arch and was spliced into the main bag using sealant tape. As you can see, the bag over the arch should have been pre-fitted to ease its assembly. We decided to pre-fit the bag for the next lamination. As the bag was worked into place, the square sections of breather cloth were positioned under the vacuum couplings. This would both ensure vacuum over the part and keep the couplings from leaving an impression on the carbon. We were also filling the pleats and tucks with sealant tape. We had to plug all the leaks. We had forced as much trapped air out of the bag as possible while massaging the bag into all portions of the mold. It is necessary to make sure the bag contacts the entire mold surface. As pressure began to build, the team worked the bag into all cavities one last time. We made sure that all portions of the bag were in full contact with the part surface. There were a few leaks to locate before maximum vacuum pressure was reached. The students simply circled the mold, listening for the telltale soft whistle of air entering the bag. When they found a leak, the wrinkle was flattened or the gap was filled with sealant. After all leaks were sealed, full pressure was achieved and the vacuum bagging process was complete. Applying heat to a curing laminate can help it cure faster and more evenly. We set up some heat lamps to help. We left the vacuum connected for eight hours and then disconnected the pump. We left the part with its vacuum bagging materials in place for another day before continuing. When we removed the vacuum bagging materials, we could see that the peel ply layer had left the desired texture which was perfect for secondary bonding. It was slightly rough and completely dry. We inspected the surface thoroughly and found that the four layers of carbon were densely packed, had no pools of resin, and had no air pockets. Since no additional repair work was necessary before continuing, we were ready to complete the second portion. To begin, we again laid out the pre-cut materials. The honeycomb, fabric, and vacuum bagging materials were laid out on the table in the order of the lamination schedule. This time, a separate bag was pre-fit to the rear wheel arch so little time would be lost once the layup began. We also decided to clean the mold flange with acetone and apply the sealant tape now. This would save time later. The paper strip was left intact, knowing that it could be removed easily when we were ready. We are now ready to begin the second lamination, 
where the first layer will be the Nomex honeycomb. To begin, another batch of epoxy was mixed for use as an adhesive. It was poured over the inner surface of the outer skin and spread to form a thick film on all the areas that the honeycomb would cover. Using a mohair roller and squeegees, the resin was worked up the sides and over the surface. The pre-cut Nomex honeycomb was laid in place. Only small relief cuts were necessary for a proper fit. Remember here you guys, work it from the center, like get in, get in the middle here, pull the outside, pull it down from, pull it down from the inside, not from above. Triangle sections of honeycomb were added to stiffen the rear wheel arch support. The epoxy was not tacky enough to completely hold the honeycomb to the vertical surfaces, so some of the students held it in place while the fiber reinforcement was added. The first of the inner skin plies was a zero degree layer of carbon fiber. It was laid in dry and wet out with resin from above. It was important to thoroughly saturate this layer, but we didn't want to apply so much resin that it would flow profusely into the cells of the core. However, most of the resin that did run through the fabric into the honeycomb would be sucked back up into the fabric by the vacuum process. This stage is tricky because you need to make sure the fabric contacts all surfaces below it, but air pockets will still appear because the honeycomb is filled with air. These air pockets will also be removed during vacuum bagging. Don't pull it up, okay? All right. Keep it down in here. Don't, like, crease it. Like, you can't just stick the thing in. You gotta make sure that when you do that, the bottom is all in place. We next applied the second inner skin layer with a 45 degree orientation to the vehicle axis. It was possible to add more resin to this layer and work it through to the first without filling the core cells. Resin was still being mixed carefully, batch by batch, as needed for each layer. The third layer of this layup was the seventh and final layer of the part. After the excess resin was removed with squeegees, we were ready to again lay in the vacuum bagging materials. Each ply had covered the wheel hub and the flange was wetted down with every ply. The vacuum bagging process was the same as before. First we laid in the same porous peel ply. Next we put in breather. Again it was positioned to guide airflow underneath the couplings. Finally the bag was laid in. Again the bag had two couplings already attached. However this time the bag for the wheel hub was already made. It was simply a matter of dropping it over and attaching it to the rest of the bag. We could also simply peel off the protective paper from the sealant tape and attach the bag much more quickly. We needed to gather extra bagging material in the contoured nose, so a large pleat was made. This was sealed with tape to itself and to the flange. We compressed the inner to the outer skin around the beveled edge of the honeycomb. We needed all excess air removed to avoid a shear failure. After connecting the vacuum and checking for leaks, only 45 minutes had passed, a considerable improvement over the first portion. We were delighted because this layup even included the honeycomb. With the full pressure achieved, the entire assembly was covered by a makeshift tent. Inside the tent, space heaters and heat lamps raised the temperature to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. We were working at nearly outside temperatures, which were about 70 degrees. The tent would contain the heat and ensure a good bond between the first portion, the honeycomb, and the rest of the three layers of graphite. The part was allowed to cure for eight hours under heat and vacuum. After that, the tent and heat sources were removed, the pump was disconnected, and the shell lamination finished its cure cycle at atmospheric pressure. The shell remained in the mold for an additional three days before we proceeded. This was due more to scheduling conflicts than to completely cure the part. However, the part should remain in the mold for at least 24 hours before trying to release it. The tape was pulled from the flange to release the bag. The bag was easily removed and discarded. The peel ply and bleeder cloth were easily pulled free from the surface. The inner skin appeared to be true and void free. It had bonded well to both the honeycomb and the outer skin. We are now ready for the seventh and final step of mold making which is to release the part from the mold. Mold release for a part this large and this rigid can really be difficult. This release went quite well for two reasons. First, it helped that it had been left in the mold for so long. The longer a part sits, the easier it will be to get it to release. Second, the dowel holes we had drilled in the bottom really helped a lot. 
After we had pried at it enough to get the flange and hub loosened a little, we turned the mold over so that we could reach the dowel holes. We had filled these holes with clay when we did the lamination so the resin would not run out. Plus, neither resin nor fabric would stick to the clay. We had to get the clay out so that we could get the dowels in, but it wasn't necessary to get it all out. We were careful not to scratch the shell. We put the dowel rods in so that we could pound them evenly to apply uniform pressure to try and release the bottom. Look at that. Isn't that, look at that, okay? Yeah, it is. Looks like to me, but okay, I... Okay, hang on. We'll get some parts there, then. I just See if you can get off the back of this thing. Maybe you can get something under here a little bit. I mean, whatever you can, because it's going to be grabbing there. Finally, we were able to shake it loose. Whoa, man! Put it on the scale! <laughs> you got to move the scale. Hang on. It's not scratching. Oh, look it's at the light, bottom man. of that! Let's get to two oh, this thing is, this thing is light. Set up a saw horse, right We were delighted with the finished shell. It was shiny and free of pinholes. We had calculated that even with the flange still on, the shell should weigh about 20 pounds. 19 pounds was fantastic. This shell was the outcome of over six months of work. We were really pleased with the weight, the finish, and the overall quality of the lamination. The project had really been a success. There was more work to do while the students and the camera crew left. Off camera, I'm going to come along and trim this with a cutoff wheel. So before you see it again next, all this will be gone, all this flange material. All this gets cut out. There's nothing in here. This isn't part of the car. This is part of the flange. This isn't part of the car. This is, so this will be here. But, this will, but by the time you next see it, it will all be trimmed up neatly and ready to have some of the secondary structures bonded in place. The flashing had to be removed before the inner mounting flanges could be constructed. The part had to be trimmed using a die grinder fitted with a reinforced cutoff wheel. Once the flash was gone, the parts were put back into the mold to determine how much more trimming was necessary. With the part removed again, the edges were sanded until they matched the molding lines perfectly. The area around the rear wheel arch was also trimmed to the proper shape. In a few areas, the trimming exposed the honeycomb. These areas were sealed using a low-density filler of epoxy resin and glass microspheres. PVA mold release agent was sprayed on the mold adjacent to the flange, and the part was put back into the mold again. Basically, what we did here was cut out a cardboard template of what the seat back would look like. This is also a bulkhead, which will be a structural member of the car. We measured front and rear where we wanted it to fit cut it to fit first out of cardboard. It's also cut so the top will go fit into the top of the car. Simply traced its outline onto the carbon fiber, notched out our template. And now we have a seat that fits. With the seat in place and the lower shell, we were ready to cut out the windscreen from the top. We knew we would need to cut out the windscreen and design the honeycomb strips to reinforce the area around the cut. The actual windscreen would be added by the students later. We did need to make an accurate cut, of course, and Scott was careful to measure and check his lines before actually cutting the graphite. The last part of our job was to be able to connect the top and bottom shells. I had to build a flange inside the parts to do this. We've reinserted the trimmed part back into the mold and we're going to put these aluminum flanges and bolt them to the sides. I just wanted to show you uh, how we're going to do that. We're going to lay up a flange on the inside surface. As you can see, the plates were all numbered and prepared to go onto the mold. I'm just going to tip the mold up on its side. So actually gravity will help the resin feed down into the corners. I'm just going to use two layers at a time. 
So we'll be going into here. And of course, I have to do it with the epoxy. We laid peel ply over the curing flange for two reasons. First, excess resin will seep through the peel ply and be removed when the peel ply is pulled off. Second, we wanted to have a bondable surface in case we needed to do another patch. At this point, Scott left all of the other modifications of the vehicle up to the students. They would have to drill holes and cut access areas for mounting the mechanical systems of the car. Scott instructed them that all holes drilled or cut into the sandwich core would have to be reinforced with a medium density putty of epoxy and milled glass fibers. The students had learned simple but unique approaches to engineering with composite structures. The honeycomb sandwich increased the stiffness of the lower shell dramatically with no change in skin thickness and little weight penalty. Vacuum bagging maximized the physical properties of all the materials. At the completion of this stage of the project, the vehicle weighed only 26 pounds. The lower shell was left unfinished so the weave of the material could be seen. The upper shell was painted by the students so it would reflect some of the heat before entering the cockpit. The composite shell had met all the design goals supporting every system of the car. These systems included the driver, steering, engine, and drivetrain. The composite car was eight pounds lighter at this stage than the similar aluminum frame car from the year before. As you can see from this video series, the techniques of plug construction, advanced mold making, sandwich core construction, and vacuum bagging are quite easy to perform and can be done in a garage or other general purpose setting. Although other super mileage vehicles in the SAE competition were constructed of fiberglass, ours was the only vehicle that was totally frameless. The graphite honeycomb vehicle was light and efficient enough to achieve fuel mileage in excess of 1,000 miles per gallon. This is the essence of the super mileage competition. We at Fiberglass Developments hope this series has given you new ideas, insights, and confidence to tackle all of your advanced molding projects. Remember, myself and the entire staff at Fiberglass Developments is happy to help you select compatible, high-quality materials for your applications. Please call us for a free catalog filled with tips, resources, and materials. We want your project to be a success. Thanks for watching.